This week on Vaticano, the Pope gives 27 new archbishops a visible sign of their leadership on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul. We take a look at the other mini events on his calendar. The Vatican prepares for major October meetings focused on the family and preference for the poor is discussed by these Catholic leaders promoting human dignity. Find out more about the parish priest that founded the Knights of Columbus and what film won this year's Mirabili Dictu Catholic Film Festival. All this, plus the Vatican's new cricket team is training for its upcoming match in the UK, and Vatican curiosities are explained in a new book. Coming up on Vaticano. Mass in St. Peter's Basilica on June 29, the feast day of Saints Peter and Paul. In the Vatican, it's the day the world's new archbishops receive the pallium. Representatives from Asia, Africa, the Americas and Europe get this special vestment directly from the Pope. It was a great honor and a privilege as always to meet the Holy Father and to be able to share a few moments with him. But it's, it's also a duty uh, because it's a sign of jurisdiction and, uh, and of communion with the Holy Father and with the See of Rome. So it was both uh, an honor and a privilege, and it was also lovely to, to meet the Holy Father once more. I reflected on the beautiful uh, prayer uh, for the blessing and conferral of the pallium in the ceremony. And what it refers to is unity and communion, the bond of charity and strength to carry out responsibilities as an archbishop. And so that's really what it is. It's a sign of our communion with the Holy Father and with one another in the College of Bishops throughout the world. We said one or two words before the Mass took place. Um, we hadn't seen each other since I stopped working for him last September because I used to work here in the Vatican. And, uh, and it was lovely. He gave me a big hug and asked me how I was. And I was able to, to give him the affection and the prayers of the people of St. Andrews in Edinburgh. And, uh, and after that, it was time for Mass. Everybody in life has their challenges, but being an archbishop, a bishop, uh, requires sometimes, uh, you know, a little extra help from heaven, uh, we might say. And so uh, this is a reminder that the Holy Father is with us in, the, in, in our uh, exercise of our ministry, and we're with him as part of the College of Bishops and the Church Universal. Pope Francis spoke frankly to them about what he expects of them as leaders in the footsteps of the Apostles. I wonder, dear brother bishops, are we afraid? What are we afraid of? And if we are afraid, what forms of refuge do we seek in our pastoral life to find security? Do we look for support from those who wield worldly power? Or do we let ourselves be deceived by the pride which seeks gratification and recognition, thinking that these will offer us security? Dear brother bishops, where do we find our security? The witness of the Apostle Peter reminds us that our true refuge is trust in God. Trust in God banishes all fear and sets us free from every form of slavery and all worldly temptation. Today, the Bishop of Rome and other bishops, particularly the Metropolitans who have received the pallium, feel challenged by the example of St. Peter to assess to what extent each of us puts his trust in the Lord. Pope Francis gave the palliums to 27 new archbishops this year. This month, Pope Francis will be taking some time to rest. While he plans to stay in Rome, he won't be hosting the Wednesday general audiences for the month of July. The same goes for his morning mass at his residence, the St. Martha House. This was the final Eucharistic celebration on June 30. He also met with the new King and Queen of Spain on the same day. They dedicated their first international trip as monarchs to visit Pope Francis in the Vatican. In the meantime, the Pope's Angelus addresses will continue through the summer. Here he was in St. Peter's Square after Mass for the Feast of St. Peter and Paul. Since ancient times, the Church of Rome celebrates the Apostles Peter and Paul in one big feast on the same day, June the 29th. Faith in Jesus Christ has made them brothers 
and martyrdom made them become one. St. Peter and St. Paul, so different from each other on a human level, have been personally chosen by the Lord Jesus and have answered the call by offering their entire lives. The grace of Christ has accomplished in both great things. It transformed them. We too, if by chance fall in the greatest of sins and in the darkest night, God is always able to transform us, as He transformed Peter and Paul, transform hearts and forgive everything, thus transforming our darkness of sin into the light of dawn. God is so. He transforms us, forgives us always, as He did with Peter and as He did with Paul. Just the day before, he was here at the Lord's Grotto in the Vatican Gardens with a group of young people from the Diocese of Rome. It was a sort of retreat as they seek to discern their vocations. Pope Francis has had to cancel several events and appointments over recent months. On June 27, Pope Francis was scheduled to visit the sick at Rome's Gemelli Hospital and celebrate the 50th anniversary of the University of the Sacred Heart housed there. But at the last minute, he couldn't be there. As spectators were waiting, Bishop Claudio Giolodori announced that the pontiff had cancelled his visit due to a sudden indisposition. The Vatican said there was no reason for concern about the Pope's health. Just a day before, Pope Francis met with young astronomers. They're attending summer classes at the Vatican's own observatory. Students from 23 countries and even of different religions are attending what's called the Specla School here in Castel Gandolfo. Durante quasi un mese voi vi siete dedicati for nearly a month, you have been dedicating yourselves not only to the study of galaxies, led by experienced teachers in this field, but you've also shared your cultural and religious traditions, giving a beautiful testimony of dialogue and coexistence in harmony. These weeks of study have given rise to scientific collaborations and lasting ties of friendship. He also met with a group of aid agencies for Oriental churches called Ruaco. He recalled his trip to the Holy Land and his prayer for peace at the Vatican with the presidents of Israel and Palestine. Pope Francis said he strongly believes that despite the past, peace can flourish once again. Those committed to cultivating must not forget that growth depends on the real farmer who is God. Moreover, the true peace that the world cannot give is given by Jesus Christ. Therefore, despite the serious injuries that unfortunately happen even today, it can always be resurrected. I always thank you because you collaborate in this field through charity, which is the truest purpose of your organizations. The Catholic Near East Welfare Association, known as CNEWA, is part of the RACO Committee. It's an intense uh, two and a half days together. And uh, we're not legislative, we don't make decisions, but what we try to do is identify with the help of these, really the experts on the ground, uh, combined with the knowledge that we've garnered with our staffs uh, to determine what, what perhaps would be the priorities for us. How can we respond? Kanewa provides educational, social and health services in countries like Syria, Iraq and Egypt. The way the church can contribute to peace is quite simple, a witness of a consistent presence. We're a reminder that yeah, you can have some stability. And with the Christians, the church wants to say, please, please, you're, you're an important asset here. Stay here. Stay here. Uh, let your faith let your faith be your anchor. And that's what I think the Pope's visit its all about. It, it was about hope. Though the Pope is officially resting up this month, he's always capable of surprises. After the slower summer months and Pope Francis' August trip to Korea, the next major Vatican event is this October's two weeks of meetings on the Church's care for the family. It's called a Synod of Bishops, and it looks like this, the last one on the new evangelization. At this late June press conference, the Vatican released the considerations that will guide this year's meetings. Cardinal Lorenzo Baldiceri, the man in charge of organizing the event, outlined their objectives. 
cellula fondamentale della società. The role of the family, the basic unit of society, the place where you learn to live with difference and to belong to one another, is a privileged space of values such as brotherhood, love, respect and solidarity among generations, where it promotes the dignity of the people, overcoming individualism and contributing to the common good of society. The beauty of family life, while on the one hand draws on the life of the Trinity as its source, on the other hand is reflected in the humble and hard-working existence of the Holy Family of Nazareth. A common lifestyle is built in differences and in reciprocity, in the relationship of the couple and with their children. Today it seems more urgent than ever to accompany the new desire for family that is being ignited in a young generation. It was also announced that a day of prayer for the Synod will be held Sunday, September 28, and the Salus Populi Romani Chapel in Rome's Basilica of St. Mary Major will also be a sanctuary for prayerful support. Daily Mass will also be celebrated each day during the Synod from October 5th to the 19th. Stay with us after the break. Christian leaders discuss the preferential option for the poor, find out more about the founder of the Knights of Columbus, and take a look at this year's winner of the International Catholic Film Festival. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Putting the preferential option for the poor at the service of human dignity was this year's theme for the Dignitatis Humana Institute's annual meeting in the Vatican. It's a very important topic for Pope Francis. This conference will be a contribution to what the Pope says, the, to, uh, for the pre preferential option for the poor. Uh, because uh, among human beings, the poor are the most, uh, the most persecuted, the most uh, 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 needy. And so uh, everybody should uh, 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 start his or her own action uh, in, in the church, uh, giving preference to the poor. One of the speakers was Flaminia Giovanelli, the highest ranking laywoman in the Roman Curia. I tried to answer a question that was the title of my talk which is, why does the church have that preferential option for the poor? So I used it to talk about this year's Lenten message of the Holy Father, in which he speaks exactly about that, and about the different concepts of poverty and misery. It's all summarized in that expression, culture of waste. I would say that it's good to have this theme, not only because it's a topic that Pope Francis insists on a lot, with respect to poverty and misery, but also because it seems that historical conditions are repeating themselves. So, since past times are being repeated, it is a bigger reason to talk about this. It's a very moving conference. I felt that just now we had a, a, a speaker who spoke about uh, uh, the richness of, uh, of getting uh, uh, the value, uh, the love for the poor, and this was something absolutely, uh, absolutely enriching. So I, I, I am still uh, meditating on, on what I'm learning here, which is very interesting. It's about knowing what the church asks for when it talks about the poor. Sometimes we have the wrong idea that prayer is only about petition, and we have the wrong idea that God, who is indeed our Father and provides, is going to come to solve what we as human beings are called to do. In that sense, it's a duty for us Christians, when we pray for the poor, to infect ourselves with that love that God has for the poor, that Jesus had for the poor. And this will then move us to take action. Prayer that isn't accompanied by action is a prayer that's far from reality because God uses us humans to be able to take action. For more information on the Institute, visit www.dignitatishumanae.com.
Historically, Father McGivney is very important because he represents the missionary spirit of the parish priest in 19th century America. Um, when Pope Benedict XVI came to New York, St. Patrick's Cathedral, he specifically pointed out the exemplary model of priesthood given by Father McGivney. Through this new translation of the book, The Parish Priest, into their own language, Italians will now also be able to discover the founder of the Knights of Columbus. It shows the universality of Father McGivney's message, very important, especially after the Second Vatican Council and the role of the laity in the church. Father McGivney is a parish priest who found a unique way to have the laity active at the parish level to help build the church. And that's precisely what he did by starting a Catholic fraternity. So starting with his story, a journalism professor is writing on the history of the Knights of Columbus. I think this book that's being translated into Italian now, which is why we're here, uh, tells the story very well of uh, the very unique role he played in American Catholicism. Uh, as, and I think the book that I'm working on extends that story quite a bit in how the Knights of Columbus, which he found it, extended his vision into uh, the rest of America for the century and a half, a century and a quarter since, his, since its founding. According to the professor, the Knights of Columbus was founded to fill a big empty space in America. What he was important for is that he said, well, we have a different way here. And that different way involves men doing things for, the, for each other, for the church and taking care of each other uh, and uh, establishing this, you know, you know, it started as, as, as a mutual benefit society. Uh, when, when a man would die, if he was a member of the Knights of Columbus, his widow would get a thousand dollars, you know, which in, in the United States that didn't happen, otherwise they might end up in the street, they might be destitute. So it filled a void and it, because it was such a powerful idea uh, and it just kept growing and it continues to grow, you know, all through America and it's extended to other countries as well since then. It's the fifth year of the International Catholic Film Festival. With 1,600 movies from 120 countries participating in the competition, only a few were among the finalists, like this one, a Peruvian nun from the 17th century who was beatified in 1985. <laughs> select films that transmit uh, uh, moral values and positive heroes. È possibile raccontare storie belle. It's possible to tell beautiful stories because the problem of cinema is not the cameraman nor the screenwriter or the director of photography. The problem is to find beautiful stories to tell. Beautiful means that it influences my life, it provokes me, it makes me take out from within even problems. These are the stories that we would like to be told in this festival. Gli aspetti problematici. Queste sono le storie che noi vorremmo venissero raccontate dal nostro festival. Io buscava l'amado di mia alma. Lo busqué e non lo hallé por las calles y las plazas. Buscaré al amado di mia alma. Io rogava che si incontrasse a mio amado le dijera che stava enferma di amore. At the beginning was difficult, uh, but now a lot of producers are producing films of this kind, with, uh, or simply Catholic films, you know, more and more. So we are very happy about that. She believes the most important thing that Catholic media and movies can bring nowadays to the public is this. The image of the, pro of the priest, because the priest is a very important person in our day society. And indeed, the following film relating to the priests that were martyred during Spain's civil war won the Best Film Award. Seamos prudentes como la serpiente, 
Y sencillos como lo que no. No tiene sentido. Van a destrozarlo todo. ¿Y nosotros qué hacemos? Nos ponemos a limpiar. Somos un militar que no quiere la guerra. Y un anarquista que no cree en matar. Pero ya no nos queda más remedio. I've seen the birth of this festival. Some people tell me I am its father. In a certain way, yes. It's also been a bit of a challenge for us. A cultural challenge, obviously, to support a demonstration that had aspects that still needed to be defined in the beginning, just five years ago. So it's very recent, but it's made very important steps forward. Stay with us after the break. The Vatican's new cricket team is preparing for their first match with the Church of England and a new book about some things you may not have known about the Vatican. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. The Vatican and the Church of England are hoping to strengthen ties in a cricket match. The Vatican's new team is going to play an Anglican squad at the Kent County Cricket Club and the Royal Households 11 at Windsor Castle from September 12th to the 20th. We're very happy that uh, we're able to organize a cricket match against the Anglican Communion. The fact that it is a group, a team of priests and seminarians, all of whom study here at Rome, to play the Anglicans at Canterbury, which, as you know, is the primal Christian see of England, the, the major cathedral. Um, that in itself is very significant for the Christian faith. And we hope, as the tour, we've called it the Light of Faith Tour, that it will give the light of faith to people there. Not just to strengthen ties, but also to give another message, that God is alive, even in sports. The very fact of seeing priests, seminarians, boys training for the priesthood um, in a public atmosphere, playing a cricket match, gives a sign to people that, that God does call young men to the priesthood, young men do respond, and that faith is something alive and active. Perhaps culture at times tends to make us forget the presence of God. And this is going to be a very white, visible presence of God on a cricket field at Canterbury. Sports can offer a lot to the churches and religions. They can help improve a Christian life. They are a powerful educative tool and uh, I think it is also important, a tool against fundamentalism, which is the true thread for many religions today. And I think sport can be a, a break, a, a barrier against fundamentalism. The Vatican's new cricket team players are mostly Indian, with also two Sri Lankans and one Pakistani. In India, cricket is a passion, like football, soccer is in Brazil or in Europe. So um, it's a way, playing cricket in India is a way of entering into the culture in a peaceful way, in a way that proposes something positive to people who perhaps would not be exposed to Christian culture. That's the idea. We don't have any definite plans to go to India yet, but we're not going to stop anybody inviting us. This Vatican historian has released a book to clarify myths and reveal unknown facts. Written in German, it's titled Der Unbekannte Vatikan, or The Unknown Vatican. Here, outside the congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, just steps away from the Pope's home, he gives us some insight. It's supposed to be a book, actually, for everyone. It should be easy to read, every person should be able to read it. It explains the Vatican, and perhaps maybe one or another curiosity or curiosities. There are always questions like, what actually is the Vatican? What does the Vatican represent? What institutions is it made up of? And I think there's a need to learn more about the church, which is 2,000 years old. The German is actually specialized in history of the popes and of the Vatican City itself. Having studied philosophy and theology in Bonn, Vienna and Rome, he's also an author of several other books. He says the unknown Vatican is a result of both years of research, but also of more recent discoveries. 
At least tried to explain this institution that was established by Pope Paul III in the year 1542. That is always seen as mysterious and scary when we see a television report on the Inquisition and religious authority. They always put music in the background that could come from some movie set in the Middle Ages, like stories by Umberto Eco. But when one looks more closely, one can see that the Inquisition authority, despite its name, was a very modern authority that during some time introduced legal exceptions, whereas in the rest of the world that was still unusual. Of course, there were shortcomings, a lot of errors were discovered, but overall it was an institution that worked with legal certainty and was something positive.